I'm Tracy Sable tonight on EWTN News Nightly, an Irish hello. President Joe Biden visits the Emerald Isle for a time of diplomacy and homecoming. Rising tension. What the president of Taiwan is saying about recent military drills by China. Cause for concern. Analysis of the FBI memo that appeared to target the faithful. And the power of prayer. Pope Francis tells us how we can overcome spiritual attacks from the devil in a new book on exorcisms. These stories and more tonight. From EWTN, the Global Catholic Network, this is EWTN News Nightly. Thank you for being with us on this feast of St. Stanislaus. Our top story tonight, a member of Congress from Ohio has issued a subpoena to FBI Director Christopher Wray. Republican Jim Jordan says that he wants answers about a since withdrawn memo from the FBI's Richmond office. The letter focused on alleged extremism within the U.S. Catholic Church. According to Representative Jordan, the Bureau was targeting Catholic Americans and seeking to use churches in part, quote, as potential sources to monitor and report on their parishioners. And joining us now with his insights is Father Dave Pavanka, president of Franciscan University of Steubenville in Ohio. Father Dave, great to see you. A lot to unpack here. But first, I want to get your reaction to this latest development. Well, it's, you know, I'm, I'm actually surprised that there hasn't been more attention to this. I, I watched some of the hearings and, and he said, well, the FBI is against this. It doesn't support this. Well, that may be said, but there's something going on in the culture that made this particular department in this particular town say, OK, we need to focus on Catholics. People are going to mass. People are worshiping. So what's taking place in the culture of the FBI today that looks at Catholics and say they're dangerous with everything that's going on in the world? They needed to focus on Catholics and being able to spy on them or watch them. It just it's just it's just beyond the pale. So the fact that we're trying to get some more answers, I think, is really important. Yeah. And Father Dave, you and I talked about this, you know, when the memo from the FBI's Richmond office was first leaked and then subsequently retracted. And I know that you also wrote an op ed for the National Catholic Register on this very issue. That said, what do you think is behind all of this? And how do you think we as Catholics should respond? What should we do? Yeah, well, first off, we as Catholics, how do we respond? We need to just be faithful to the gospel. We need to be faithful to the church. And that's exactly what I think causes some people anxiety, which causes some people in the government today anxiety, is the reality is, is us being faithful, um, dynamic, living Catholic life, living the Catholic life. We live in a world right now that there are certain individuals in the government that see that as a problem, that see that we should not be able to do that, that then now if I espouse a, a traditional understanding of Christian marriage or human sexuality, that, that I'm seen as a problem or or even worse, that I need to be silenced. So what do we as Catholics do? We need to be faithful. We need to speak up. We, we ought not be afraid. We also, I think, need to become aware that more and more of this, I'm, I'm afraid, like I, I, the power of prayer, I heard you talk about the power of prayer. The power of prayer is essential and, and we have to believe in that. But I also think that honestly, we're going to see more trouble. We're going to see more pushback. We're going to see more organizations, more institutions pushing back on faithful Catholics. We're the ones who are now being labeled. We're the ones who are now the problem. And, and we need to be able to push back. What do I think is behind it? You know, I, I think that there's a growing population that doesn't want to see uh, faithful Catholics be able to worship, to be able to speak up. And I think they want to be si they want to silence us. They want to marginalize us. They want to put us, push us to the side. And we simply can't let that happen. We've seen traditionally and historically when Catholics are quiet, when they don't speak up, when they don't, you know, proudly proclaim what the church teaches, um, bad things happen in our country. So we as Catholics need to be faithful to who we are. Yeah, and, and you know this memo, Father David, specifically mentions Catholics. I mean, there's no other religion mentioned. And we have a Catholic president, the second Catholic president in U.S. history. I don't believe we've heard directly from President Joe Biden about all this. How do you think he should respond, if at all? And what do you think he should do? I mean, your thoughts on this? Well, it, honestly, it breaks my heart. You know, it breaks my heart that he didn't come out the day after this memo was leaked and said, this is unacceptable. And, you know, I hate to see individuals who are fired because I know that impacts families and, and, and livelihoods and all that. 
But whoever was behind this, we need to be, and I think that's what Congressman Jordan's trying to find out, is who is behind this, and there needs to be repercussions. The president, I would love for him to intervene in this. Honestly, the power of prayer, we can pray for that. I just don't know that we have a president right now who's willing to do that. Yeah, it's all concerning. And like you said, we, we have to continue to pray. Before I let you go, what else is on your radar? What are you following? Well, first off, it's, you know, to be able to celebrate uh, the grace that is in Easter. And I've just found myself, as we've been hearing the word revival going on, you know, with the things that were taking place in the Bronx and the Catholic Church and the Protestant Catholic, uh, Protestant school in Asbury, just this continual, Lord, come with your Holy Spirit, come with life, come with your presence and, and, and light a fire uh, amongst the faithful people today. Uh, I think we need that. We need more of living as a resurrection people. I did a podcast the other day and I said, uh, I think sometimes we as Catholics, we know how to fast, but do we know how to feast? Do we know how to celebrate? Do we know how to be able to live as an Easter people? So I just want to encourage uh, everyone listening, let's let's be who we are, and that is a people that live in hope and the power and the grace of the resurrection. Wonderful message. Father Dave, always so great to be with you. Thank you so much. It's God always bless you. Good to be. Thank you so much. Well, last summer, Congress passed the Respect for Marriage Act aimed at prote protecting, that is, same-sex marriages. But a group of Republicans say loopholes make religious institutions and charities vulnerable to retaliation, and they want new protections in the bill. Capitol Hill correspondent Eric Rosales joins us now with the latest. Eric? Well, good evening, Tracy. You know, Texas Congressman Chip Roy is leading the effort to amend the bill. He says that current protections in the law just fall short to protect religious organizations who oppose same-sex marriage. He tells me without these protections, people could be targeted for simply living out their faith, just like we've seen in the past. We had the famous cake baker situation in Colorado. We've had numerous uh, situations where people own, you know, bed and breakfast or other things. Or how about, um, you know, you got private Christian schools that are getting in, in increasingly being targeted uh, because you have a, a belief that in your under your closely held religious beliefs uh, of a certain view of marriage. Congressman Chip Roy and 23 other House Republicans have written to the House Appropriations Committee leaders to add protections for religious observers. The letter states in part, quote, without this language, we fear that the federal government Government will begin to systematically discriminate against religious schools, faith-based organizations, and other nonprofits by barring their participation in federal programs and removing their tax-exempt status for their views on marriage. He cites groups that help the poor and hungry, mentor to at-risk kids, and rebuild homes and minister to soldiers and first responders are at risk. Specifically, Congressman Roy wants to add language that prohibits the federal government from taking, quote, any discriminatory action against a person in accordance with a sincerely held religious belief or moral conviction that marriage is or should be recognized as a union of one man and one woman. Congressman Roy tells me Congress has to step in to codify those rights. Look, I think this is pretty straightforward. Uh, frankly, I think the First Amendment kind of already takes care of it, but we have to make sure as Congress that we're underscoring that and passing legislation consistent with the, with the Bill of Rights and with the, uh, the Constitution to ensure our rights are being protected. Bottom line, it is important to note that Republicans do not deny the Respect for Marriage Act. They simply want this amendment included to make sure that religious organizations and charities are not threatened by the federal government. Congressman Roy hopes to have this amendment added to the 2024 government spending bill. At the Capitol, Eric Rosales, EWTN News Nightly. Our President Joe Biden responds to a question about abortion as he left for a multi-day trip to Ireland and Northern Ireland. He took a swipe at a judge in Texas who issued a ruling that would halt the approval of Mifepristone, the chemical abortion drug. It is a ruling pro-lifers say will save lives. White House correspondent Owen Jensen reports. Owen. Tracy, good evening to you. Tonight, the Justice Department is appealing the Texas court ruling, calling the decision, quote, extraordinary and unprecedented. This, as pro-life groups say, Mifepristone has killed some 5.6 million children. President Joe Biden, before boarding Air Force One to head overseas, is asked this morning what his thoughts are on the judge's ruling in Texas regarding Mifepristone. My thoughts are it's completely out of bounds what the judge did. The Biden administration has asked an appeals court to allow access to the drug while the case continues to play out. Since its approval, Mifepristone has been used by more than 5 million women seeking abortion. 
but pro-life live action writes, This deadly drug is approved for use up through 10 weeks of pregnancy, at which point a human child has arms, eyelids, fingers, toes, and organs. These children have beating hearts, and if they were not intentionally killed, they would live. Adding, the FDA's decision to approve the chemical abortion pill was egregiously wrong from the outset and has been a grave wound in the soul of our country. As for his trip overseas, President Biden told reporters his top priority is this. Make sure the Irish Accords and the Windsor Agreement stay in place. Keep the peace. That's, that's the main thing. And it looks like we're going to keep your fingers crossed. Also today, Vice President Kamala Harris meets with Poland's Prime Minister at the White House to discuss support for Ukraine as it battles Russia. Poland is a major donor of aid to Ukraine. Poland is a valued ally, a partner, and a friend, and we have an enduring relationship based on shared priorities and democratic values. Meanwhile, 2024, the Windy City, that's where Democrats will host their national convention. President Biden chose Chicago over other finalists that included New York and Atlanta. Republicans will have theirs, by the way, just up the road on I-94 in Milwaukee, Wisconsin in 2024. At the White House, Owen Jensen, EWTN News Nightly. And we have a lot more still to come here on EWTN News Nightly, including trouble in the Pacific. How Taiwan's president is responding to China's recent military drills, plus fighting for parental rights. What a Texas bishop is saying about school choice. How the president of Taiwan is condemning China's recent military drills. Our President Tsai Ing-wen says the exercises did not demonstrate, quote, responsible behavior. Beijing's military drills near Taiwan included a simulation sealing off the island. Afterwards, China said its military is, quote, ready to fight. We go now to Gordon Chang, author of The Coming Collapse of China and the Great U.S.-China Tech War. Gordon, always great to have you with us. Uh, first off, what do you think of these actions by China and what they signal? Incidentally, uh, coming just days after Taiwan's president met with Speaker of the House Kevin McCarthy. Well, China always prepares to fight, and we have seen this over the course of decades. But what they're using is the McCarthy Tsai Ing-wen meeting, plus also the McCall delegation to Taiwan as just an excuse. And, and Beijing is right now trying to intimidate Taiwan and the United States with these extremely provocative drills. This is what they did after House Speaker Nancy Pelosi went to the island last August. And they will continue to do this because they think that they can actually get the United States to back down. I'm not saying they're right, but that's what they're trying to do. And that's, I think, what they, in fact, think. Yeah, and as mentioned, as you also said, you know, Beijing saying their military is, quote, ready to fight. Gordon, really, how seriously should we take all of this? And why are they doing this now? Yeah, and we should take this extremely seriously, because whenever your adversary or your enemy tells you something, you should, um, you should, you should understand that they mean what they say. Um, at this particular time, we know that China is preparing to go to war. It's not only engaged in the fastest military buildup, but Xi Jinping is trying to sanction-proof his regime. He talks about war all the time. And he's actually mobilizing China's civilians for war. So although we don't know what he actually, in fact, thinks, we know what he is, in fact, doing. And we have a senior leadership in the Pentagon, um, both in uniform and civilians, who actually just sort of slough this off, who think, oh, he can't actually mean that. Well, yes, he can. And also, Tracy, the other thing we have to worry about is the possibility of accident, because China is engaging in these extremely belligerent uh, intercepts in the global commons. Yeah, and Gordon, how do you think the U.S. should respond to all this? I mean, what should we do? And what about the international community? I mean, we recently saw French President Emmanuel Macron. Uh, he recently met with President Xi in Beijing, and, and Macron was even quoted as saying uh, that Europe should not be caught up in a disordering of the world and a crisis that aren't ours. Um, your thoughts on all this? Well, President Biden should publicly say to Macron, well, if you think that Taiwan is not your fight, then should the United States think that Ukraine is not ours? You know, Macron can say what he wants, but the problem for France and for Germany and some other countries in uh, Europe 
is that they're not willing to uh, pay for their own defense. And so they rely on the United States. Now, they say all these things because they know that we're Americans and we'll just not pay attention to them. But at some point, we have to say to them that they've got to step up and actually start building up their militaries because Russia intends to move on the rest of Europe. That's clear. And Gordon, before I let you go quickly, uh, what other stories are you following right now? Well, I think the most important thing right now is what's happening inside of China, which you have a very, um, very soft economy, contracted last year, contracted the first two months of this year. Uh, the reason why this is important is because Xi Jinping knows he has no answer for domestic problems for which he is considered to be the author of policies that have caused those problems. So his best course from his perspective is to start a war with somebody, distract the Chinese people. We need to understand that weakness inside of China is driving some very, very provocative events externally. Well, Gordon, always great to get your insights. We appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thank you, Tracy. Up next on EWTN News Nightly, putting families first. A bishop in Texas is calling for school choice, what he is saying about Catholic schools and taxpayer dollars. Plus, Pope Francis teaches us a simple way to overcome spiritual attacks from the devil. The governor of Texas has made school choice a priority on his legislative agenda, and church leaders are following suit. The Texas Catholic Conference of Bishops is calling on the faithful to support school choice. Pope Francis has in the past written about the idea, saying, quote, schools do not replace parents, but complement them. Republican Governor Greg Abbott says that his plan would ensure parents are in charge of their child's education, not the government. And joining us now is Bishop Michael Olson of the Diocese of Fort Worth, Texas. Your Excellency, great to have you with us today. Uh, the Texas Senate passed its school choice proposal, which would return public education tax dollars to parents. And I know you recently testified uh, before lawmakers about this issue. What more can you tell us about this legislation? Uh, well, what's what's unique about this re legislation, particularly one bill that we're very excited about, sponsored by Representative James Frank, uh, Bill Number Forty Three Forty, is that it prioritizes people and it begins with the poor, and then it begins also with those whose uh, financial ability is is greatly inhibited to to pay for a, a Catholic school tuition uh, because of multiple students and because of the costs that are incurred and the stress on family life. And then it proceeds on also to special needs children so that there's a prioritization uh, for this money that would be allotted that would go to parents, all right, and not directly to our schools. So our religious liberty would be protected this way, at least as this bill is written. And I think that's something that I, for one, am very concerned about, uh, that I, I wouldn't be in favor of this if those protections were not somehow guaranteed. Yeah, and I understand um, in a commentary issued last month that you, along with Leo Lindbeck III, an American businessman, uh, said that Texans have no control of their children's education. If you can explain to us, you know, what exactly you meant by that, and also can you share with us you know, why you believe Catholic education is so important? Certainly. I think that, um, in a sense, our expectations in our nation as a whole, and not just in Texas, but uh, it, are placed upon, we, we sort of just think that the state is responsible for providing for our schools and the education of our children. That's a grave mistake, and it's certainly a terrible thing that we should presume because parents have the chief responsibility and duty and schools are ancillary essential uh and there are state interests in education uh but they don't uh precede that of the parents obviously uh there's a collaborative method but the primary agents of education are the parents mothers and fathers um i i also think our catholic education especially is needed because our Catholic intellectual tradition uh, is so rich in the resources that uh, intellectually, both in faith and reason, that we need to educate and sustain our society to help it grow and develop 
because of the impoverishment of values uh, that have been brought about by the contemporary ideologies that confuse the dignity of human beings uh, with just simply a commodity or something that is only a matter of artifice or convention. Your Excellency, we have maybe 30 seconds left or so, but I'm curious um, what you think is next for education reform? What would you like to see? Uh, I would like to see this bill given a chance and in a sense to, uh, I, I would see a greater renewal in our Catholic schools with our identity, especially driven to our mission to educate the poor, but also to, to present our sound Catholic anthropology based in natural law and the gospel. Well, Your Excellency, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us about all this. We appreciate it. And God bless you. Thank you. Bless you, too. Well, the Vatican recently spoke out against the exploitation of lands and historical forced assimilation of Native peoples. The document addressed the so-called doctrine of discovery. In it, the Holy See says taking land from original inhabitants has never been a part of Catholic teaching. It adds, however, that previous popes could have done more to address the rights of indigenous people. Joining us now from Rome is Andreas Tonhauser, EWTN Vatican Bureau Chief. Andreas, great to see you. Um, what can you tell us about this statement from the Vatican? So, Tracy, I think this joint statement of two separate Vatican departments about the so-called doctrine of discovery is probably one of the most overlooked news coming from the Holy See. Of course, there's a reason for that. Uh, to issue this statement just before Easter is a little bit problematic, probably. And then with the health situation of the Holy Father, where he was brought to the Jamelli Clinic also before Easter, there were simply no headlines left for this more historical news piece, as I would call it. But I think it's still important to talk about it. Cardinal Mendonta, he's the new prefect of the Dicastery for Culture and Education and the prefect of the Dicastery for Integral Human Development, Cardinal Michael, Ch Michael Journey, presented their joint statement clearly saying that this doctrine of discovery is not and has never been part of Catholic teaching. What do they mean by this? Well, this concept of discovery refers back to the early days of European colonialism when human rights to indigenous people in Africa or America were denied or simply ignored. The church has always sought to protect these rights of, of all humans as being created in the image of God. And Andreas, why do you think the Vatican released this statement now? And also, what relevance uh, may it have? So we see that this statement is tied to recent travels of Pope Francis to places such as Africa and Canada, especially on the North American continent. Indigenous groups asked him to revoke the so-called doctrine. Of course, it's not a Catholic doctrine. In fact, it has nothing to do with the teachings of the Church. However, in their statement, the two cardinals now refer to three papal writings, so-called papal bulls, from the 15th century. So. It's important to remember that we're speaking here about documents that were largely written before Columbus even reached the Americas. While the statement acknowledged that these writings did not grant equal dignity to indigenous, uh, it also once more apologized for that fact. However, the cardinals also reminded us that in 1532, the bull Sublimus Deus by Paul III, Pope Paul III, advocated in favor of indigenous people in both Africa and the Americas, clearly acknowledging their rights, and it also denounced any form of slavery. And this is extremely important to remember. While single missionaries might have been bad actors, and several popes also have apologized for the church's role in colonialism, we must not forget that it was also missionaries and priests who recognized God's image in indigenous people and started to protect and advocate for them. A uh, very famous example is St. Peter Claver in, in Cartagena, one of the biggest slave trade ports uh, in Colombia, who ministered to the slaves in the 16th century. And he's just one of many examples. Well, Andreas, thank you so much for this report. We appreciate it. Andreas Tonhauser, EWTN Vatican Bureau Chief. Thank you again. Well, finally tonight, Pope Francis reminds the faithful that the devil seeks our failure but can do nothing if we keep praying. In a previously unpublished interview, the Holy Father says the devil tries to attack everyone and prayer is the best way to remain safe. The remarks were part of a new book on exorcisms written by an Italian journalist that hit the shelves today. Uh, we thank you for watching tonight. And remember, you can follow us on social media, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at EWTN News Nightly. I'm Tracy Sable. Good night and God bless.